this is, let's see, oh, look at those guys. Well, this is amazing. I, I mean, I was here seven years ago. Eric Lewis uh, set up the, you know, uh, after the Great Divide, which is, I guess, taken from the, um, my colleague who retired. Um, 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 boy, I'm trying to remember all these names. Uh, maybe I should retire soon. Um, <laughs> Andreas Hewson. But, um, you know, I had, I had a bunch of stuff I was taking notes about. Seven years, it's been great to be here. My, my son was here, he was seven years old, now he's 14. You know, Pauline Alvaros was here, she's not with us anymore, but, uh, you know, she is, really. I mean, my spouse, uh, composer and sound artist, Mia Masaoka was here, a lot of great people were here. And now, you're all here, and just then as now, it was a very distinguished group of people who are here, and I'm very excited. To, I, I don't know, it's amazing. I already see people I'm afraid to really, uh, you know, I see a lot of people I know. So, <laughs> so it's wonderful to really be here. I mean, I could thank, you know, the Onassis Center and Christos, and there's a whole group here. I, I can't, I thought I would just say the names because I, there are a bunch of them. I can't say everybody, but there's Pasqua Vorja, Desfina uh, Sifniaru, Christina Pituli, I just saw her. Uh, Georgos Dedusis, uh, Jonas Kritikos, and, and other people. So um, they made my life wonderful to come here and everything. And then there's Anastasia. It was wonderful to see her again, and thanks for that wonderful talk introduction. And the amazing visionary, Gerard, and his, and his team. You'll see more about that later. I was going to, before I start about the talk, start into the talk, I just wanted to say one thing about that business of us being neglected, you know? I mean, I tell people, people tell me that all the time, you know, say improvisation is neglected, you know? I say, well, you know, in my world, I'm at the center, you know? And so right now, I think if you're working on improvisation, you can be at the center with me. In fact, we're all gonna be at the center for the next few days here. And so I mean, there's a lot of new work that on improvisation in a critical way, in a, in a, in a, in a scholarly way. And so we're going to be basking in the center of things for the next few days, and they really won't be able to get rid of us that easily. So just imagine that as we move ahead into the body of the talk, which is, um, is of two parts, really. There's two. It's sort of like time is a circle here. Um, so that's uh, Arnold Davidson, and that's me, I guess. We're sitting in, um, where the devil are we? Perugia, right. Uh, I met Arnold in 2007 at a conference called Ruptures, uh, Music, Philosophy, Science, Modernity. It was co-organized by Arnold and the composer Martin Brody, and it took place at the Max Planck Institute for uh, Wissenschaftsgeschichte in Berlin. So uh, Arnold gave this amazing talk, Ex Exemplarity and the Aesthetics of Difference from Michel Foucault to Cecil Taylor. And there were these wonderful sections on my former mentors and bandmasters, Muhal Richard Abrams and Eric and Steve Lacey, and it really did kind of bring me to tears. You know, I wasn't used to sort of crying in a philosophy lecture. It was sort of new to me. It made a really strong emotional impact on me. Um, so, and my talk was called Living with Creative Machines. So I don't remember when I started thinking about these things as being creative machines, but it had to be at least 2007. Um, and it drew from my ongoing work that uh, maybe some of you know about this business of live improvised dialogue with interactive virtual improviser, to use the buzzword of the day, computer programs. So I've been working on these programs for quite a long time, uh, around 1979. And um, you can see, I think you can even see the date, some of those old things. And um, you, know, you, see, you see what the basement bombers were doing. Um, they analyze aspects of their environment. In most cases, the improvisation of other human performers, they do that in real time, or what we think of as being real time anyway. Um, using that analysis to guide the generation of complex responses to what they find. So the programs, my programs, also establish their own independent generative and analytic behavior. They don't need you. Um, so that's a big problem for people who think that, what did I hear, the humans are always in the mix? Not in my music. Sometimes they just move out. <laughs> so, so we'll get more into that later because that's, that's a bone of contention. And what co-creativity means and who the co-creators are is a matter of something we have to think more about. Um, so humans, in the, the funny thing about uh, you know, working with improvising machines is that we have to earn our place again. You know, 
we can't just assume that it exists and it's ours. The chair is all going to be there and all you have to do is sit in it. You know, we'll come there and we will find it occupied if we don't work on it. Anyway, um, so they don't need real time, you don't need human input to generate music. Um, in 1976, that's where it started for me, around that time, a group of musicians were calling themselves the League of Automatic Music Composers, and they were working with one of my other mentors, a lot of mentors, so David Behrman. Um, they were developing interactive systems using what were then called microcomputers, and in conjunction with what they also called homemade electronic interfaces. So it was a real sharp contrast to the kind of institutional base of most computer music at the time in America and Europe. I mean, these people, Rich Gold, John Bischoff, Jim Horton, they just used their own money and they bought these mail order single board computers for around 250 bucks. They taught themselves to program the computers in machine language, like you saw in the little excerpts of my own little scribblings up there. Um, learned the intricacies of programming the output chips and eventually connected their computers to both human instrumentalists and other computers in a kind of a network conception. Those of you who know this group called The Hub, that was the outgrowth of the League of Automatic Music Composers, some of the same people. And, they, and these, this networking uh, structure mirrored the community they had formed as a support network for their technological interventions. Now, each of the League's computers was running a program created by one of its composers that was able to produce music again without outside intervention, an automatic improvisation program, or you can call it an automatic composition program. They don't know. The computers don't care. Or I think they don't care. So it, it, right away, that brings up the idea of what is improvisation and what is composition, and do we have to really have that, uh, do we have to have that great divide, uh, which, we, which is often so lovingly cherished in classical music. Um, but in fact, uh, com computer, computer programs uh, problematize that. Um, so <clears throat> the automatic uh, improvisation programs took in data that could affect the behavior of its own systems and the output data that could affect the behavior of the other machines. Now here's what they had to say about it. The musical system can be thought of as three stations, each playing its own sub-composition, which receives and generates information relevant to the real-time improvisation. No one station has an overall score. The non-hierarchical structure of the network, get that word, non-hierarchical, once again, um, encourages multiplicity of viewpoints and allows separate parts of the system to function in a variety of musical modes. This means that the moment-to-moment -moment form the music takes is the combined result of the overlapping individual activities of the parts, with the coordinating influence of the data exchange between the computers. Now, what I found was particularly transgressive was the league, they had this thing, they just would set the thing up and they would sit back and listen to it. They, they call it letting the network play. You know? <laughs> you know, I mean, they'd be sitting there and they'd just turn them on and they would listen to them improvising. And as John Bischoff recalled, we spent a few hours setting these things up and then we just let the network play. And this is one example. They look like they're doing a lot of manipulation, but they're really not. I think they're just controlling volume, if, they're, if even they're doing that. Can we hear that? Is it on? We're not on. We're, somehow we went off. I don't know why we went off. Can we have sound again? Somehow we lost the sound. Coming from here. Can we get sound? How do, how do we miss it? I didn't do it. Is there anyone can help out? Okay, thanks. Well, anyway, um, I want to play this for you, and so I don't want you to miss this. Um, but I might move ahead a little bit, and I'll go back to it if I need to, because I know everyone, you know, there's a lot of things have to be done. There's a concert coming up. I don't want to take too much time. Um, but I will be checking. Oh, there we, there we are. Sound. Thank you very much. And here we go. Let the network play. Thank you. 
So those are three uh, Kim One computers of the kind, little microcomputer uh, boards of the kind that I showed earlier. That's uh, Tim Perkis, and the other two people, the other bearded person was Jim Horton, and the non-bearded person was John Bischoff. Now, you might have seen a, a cassette recorder sitting there. Those cassette recorders weren't for the purpose of creating additional sounds. That was the data storage system. So you had to run things off on cassettes. You imagine how, you know, and look at that. No, you know, it's a very different world. Um, one thing that occurs to me in listening to this is that um, when you let the network play, what you're doing is you're not just, it's not just a technological move or not even a move of kind of hubris. You're actually letting the network decide what music is. In other words, you're learning from the network what music could be. And uh, it might not be the same thing that you thought music was before the network played. So you don't, you don't necessarily, even though you did program it, in some sense there's the programming of it. It's like, it's like genotype and phenotype. You know, there's the programming of it, and then there's what happens when the thing gets out into the world and starts playing. So at that point, all bets are off about what you find out about what music is. And so you have to let go of your concept sometimes about what music is and what it's for. Um, so, so Rich Gold, who you didn't see there, who was one of the early founders of it, uh, he, um, they had, the league had a lot of talk about critiquing highly structured business and academic institutions, but you know, around about 85, Rich Gold joined the corporate world and he started make, running these video game companies. One of the video games he made was Little Computer People, described in one article as the first fully autonomous computerized AI game. Now, around this time, I remember running into Rich in San Francisco, I think it was, just, I wasn't, you know, around 19, I don't know, probably around, around this time. He told me, well, I'm working on a, a little person that lives on your hard drive. I said, well, that sounds cool. What's it gonna do? He said, oh, whatever it wants. So the conception of the little computer person was clearly an outgrowth of the let the network play social aesthetics of Bay Area microcomputer experimentalism. The screen presented, you'll see this in a minute, I have a little screenshot, a two-dimensional representation of a house, dining room, living room, kitchen, recreation area. The virtual person played the piano, exercised, watched TV, performed a lot of everyday tasks, and completely ignoring the so-called user, who is often relegated to the status of voyeur, hence the, hence the characterization autonomous. It was basically a representation of improvisation in everyday life. Uh, users became aware that the LCPs are basically very independent, and this is a mode of machine agency that framed the LCP not only as an object invested with agency, but as a kind of a quasi-subject. So here's a little example. So the user is typing things in, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, so you could see, I mean, anyway, you see where that's headed um, in a way. Now, in 1991, uh, Gold took a position at the uh, now legendary Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, Xerox Park, and became an integral part of the development of what was called, then called ubiquitous computing, or Ubicomp and working with, uh, according to uh, the, some of the major figures who included Mark Weiser and uh, John Seeley Brown, uh, they can, for them, the idea of ubiquitous computing first arose from contemplating the place of today's computer in actual activities of everyday life. So there's a lot of remediation involved with that. So for example, in a 1993 article called This Is Not a Pipe, a gold complements and remediates 
uh, surrealist painter Rene Magritte's famous painting to present a vision of the computational remediation of everyday objects. So he says, ubiquitous computing is a new metaphor in which computers are spread invisibly throughout the environment, embedding and hiding, as it were, within the objects of our everyday life. Each of these computers can talk with any of the other computers, much like chattering animals in a living journal, living jungle, sometimes exchanging detailed information, sometimes noting just what's around. So this is a the traditional lunchbox, and you see what's happening here, steel box of strength, sweet snack, remember mom, handle for safety. And this is the Ubicomp lunchbox, uh, bully sensor, video camera, video monitor, goes on from there, location sensor, odor enhancer, things like that. Um, Gold concluded that um, through computational remediation, everyday objects will become, quote, deeply inspirited, and that's an invocation of what I've els elsewhere called technology-mediated animism. Um, Wiser, Gold, and Brown realized that Ubicomp created a new field of computer science, one that speculated on the physical world, richly and invisibly woven with sensors, actuators, displays, and computational elements, embedded seamlessly in the everyday objects of our lives and connected through a continuous network. Now, arguably, Gold's part in the improvisative social aesthetics of Barrier interactive computer music became an integral part of this conception of deeply embedded human computer interaction that we now find in the Internet of Things. So, this is what I mean by improvisation being at the center of things. See, and so you have to just, just look under the surface and don't believe those people who tell you that you're marginal. Um, just don't pay any attention to them. Um, now, at the behest of David Behrman, uh, in 1978, I attended a rehearsal of the League of Automatic Music Composers, and I was just Fascinated. I told Curtis Rhodes for his book on composers in the computer. It was like a band of improvising musicians. You could hear the communication between the machines as they would start, stop, and change musical direction. Each program had its own way of playing. And I just said, well, I got to get one of these things. So at some point around 1979, I started to actually put on performances, and that's what they sounded like. struck by the similarity between that and the first magenta imp uh, pieces. <laughs> That's just my thing. I don't want to go there with that. But in any event, um, the Kim and I, that's what that piece was called. It wasn't an interactive piece. But so I began to realize that desire with another piece called Chamber Music for Humans and Non-Humans, which is probably some of that stuff I wrote was for that piece. It was programmed in fourth and used digitally controlled analog electronics as a sound source and also to capture pitch information. And the these are the basic principles or social aesthetics of interactivity that I've lived by uh, from that moment basically to the present. And it's surprisingly stubborn. Um, so, um, uh, this was at a time when uh, there was a bit of extra talk, loose talk about improvisation around IRCOM, and Rainbow Family was a fourth program. That was the first of my interactive orchestra pieces, which featured up to four human improvisers performing with three network Apple II-driven Yamaha synth synthesizers. And the, I think it was interesting that, like uh, the work that uh, Gerard and Mark Chimulier uh, and Georges Bloch are doing now, that creation of this work involved quasi-ethnographic processes during rehearsals, performances of the sort that recall the general notion and practice of artistic research. Now, here's an example of that from a documentary film that IRCOM made on the piece. Um, so you can see, see some of what happened, what, this, my, the state of my art in 1984. <laughs> Same seasoning that we do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but he's improvising anyway. Mm -hmm. So 
I deal with that. Yeah. And then I use uh, all the stuff that you feed me. Yeah. And I, I deal with that as well. Yeah. What do you think? I'm well. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I'm well. I, I, I listen to well, I don't know. What do you think, you? I don't have anything to think. I'm just trying to figure out what what you might um, need or, or want in the in the way the machine's playing. What do you think? Anything? You can call the machine try it like a game. It's like a game. Yeah. Like, I'm just interested in like how you feel interactionally. Well, I'm well. Is it's cool? Yes. Okay. Now, I'd like, to, I'd like to turn your attention to what Douglas Ewart said, that phrase, well, the machine is improvising anyway. Uh, that's not about an exploration of the metaphysics of machine consciousness, but it's really about a phenomenology of freedom in a dialogic interaction, in which a creative machine can be perceived by us as acting in a free way, uh, sonically, and we take that information in by exchange of sounds. Uh, and I, I thought it was, I thought, I don't know, I, I thought they should have just bought the robot a, a seat. I mean, they do it for cellos all the time. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, it suffices for the interaction that they, I mean, they should have done it on their own money. I mean, like, it suffices for the interaction that the device is free with respect to us, and that its action is not one that we can foresee or control, we'll get to that a little bit of that later, but perhaps one that we can perceive, that we can influence through dialogue, just as if it were a free being like us, and that simply acts in a way that demands a response in return. So, now, there's this, that was pre-Voyager land. Now, around about 87 at the Mass College of Art, uh, I made this new thing called Voyager. It's been through a lot of transformations. It's been around much too long. And um, the first versions were developed at Stein in Amsterdam around 86, but the computers couldn't run them. Uh, we had 10 CX-5 music computers, and we, I tried to get as big an orchestra as I could, but none of them could run. The, and we made it as lean as we could. I had to learn Z80 assembly language to try to speed the damn thing up. It was just too slow. And then the uh, Ataris came along, and that made life easier. Now, between 1987 and 2000, uh, concert versions of Voyager were implemented in various dialects of fourth, Formula, Ron Cleveland's fourth music language, HMSL, Phil Burke, and David Rosenblum's hierarchical music specification language, and others. Uh, and uh, this is an example from 1994. Um, that was, by the way, you can see that, that's an example of fourth code. This is, um, this is actually a sort of a stability checker. Its job is to see if things are kind of stable, if, if, the, if the musician, if the outside world is kind of not varying that much, because one of my theories about the way group improvisation works is that there's a, there's a moment of stability, and then people get bored or they feel like they want to make a change, so then there's a kind of an interregnum and things become unstable, and eventually there's an agreement on consensus and things get stable again. So this thing was designed to actually um, uh, test the stability and to see when to find those moments of stability. And I'd never used it, and I'd never, it, I'd never implemented it, but uh, we, we coded it up in Max MSP in, in 2018, and I'll be damned, it worked. But anyway, um, so you never know, you should keep everything. Um, that was from, you know, 95 or something. Any event, so this is a, what that sounded like a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. 
So fast forward about 11 years, and I'm working, and that's, I do, I'm, I work with the composer and technologist Damon Holsborn to develop the first of the Voyager piano players, and a lot of people have heard what their image of Voyager was, the piano playing Voyager. Well, that was the virtual orchestra Voyager, which was, that was the first model that was actually done. Um, and so we had to make some translations, so I translated, we had to translate all the fourth code first into, I just translated, Damon didn't know fourth, didn't, and I was a very lousy Max programmer, and still am. So I just translated the whole thing into this pseudocode, and then Dame was able to read that and translate that into Max speak. So that's the same uh, routine in three different representations. Um, it, all it does is it makes things louder. <laughs> it's a lot of work to do that. Um, so, um, so this ended up being a piece that was, this was the debut performance of the Voyager pianist. It was at the large hall, what they now call Stern Hall and Carnegie Hall, the American Composers Orchestra. This is probably the first computer performer, maybe, to make a Carnegie Hall debut. And this is the pianist that you'll hear, some, a version of that tomorrow. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good outcome. I, I wasn't expecting it to follow the chord changes. You know, I mean, the idea was, you can see these little microphones. There was one on the principal clarinet, one on the trumpet, one on principal trombone, and one on uh, the principal violin. And that seemed to be enough to capture most of what was going on. And uh, other than that, uh, the, uh, the, it was like a regular concerto, right? The piano was in the front. And it was just, you know, it would just listen to whatever it heard as it was doing there. I mean, there was not any agreement on anything. So, I mean, it could have botched it pretty badly, but I thought it did pretty well in that part anyway. But it went on for 17 minutes, and I was sitting in the balcony. So, I mean, like, uh, right away that was, uh, you know, if it had crashed, I mean, actually, it didn't. So there you go. <laughs> so I want to move toward the conclusion of my talk, uh, uh, rather slowly, however, uh, by going ahead from the Carnegie Hall Voyager to go back to that Berlin a Voyager uh, performance of 2007. In addition to the talk, I gave a performance of this, that pianist with uh, Mary Oliver, the violinist, uh, the pianist Alexander von Schlippenbach, a founder of the European Free Improvisation Movement and a longtime resident of Berlin, and me playing the trombone, which I don't do as much as I used to. But in any event, I, I, don't have a trans, I don't have access to a transcript of the remarks made during the discussion, but I remember clearly that Arnold Davidson became one of the most vocal participants, consistently drawing out the philosophical implications of the performance in terms of agency, personal identity, intersubjectivity, ethics, and social um, responsibility. Um, these areas have been central to Davidson's thought, but the implications of his ideas for the understanding of improvisation have rarely been published, so I've drawn upon transcripts that I've made uh, between 2008 and 2012 for, to tease out some of uh, Davidson's ideas. So one year after the 2007 events, uh, the Center for Jazz Studies at Columbia University, which I used to be the director of until 2010, 
organized a colloquium on improvisation and ethics that it was a series of philosophers um, who are featuring uh, Davidson as the main speaker. In his lecture, Davidson maintained that, quoting here, it's not only a question of explaining how philosophy and especially a certain conception of ethics can help us to understand improvisation, but also showing how improvisation can help us to see how to conceptualize ethics. I don't have a standard conception of ethics that I want to apply to improvisation. I want to show how certain forms of improvisation are useful for thinking about the very idea of ethics itself. So Davidson I spent a lot of time engaging with the thought of Michel Foucault, and his interpretation of, of Foucault's work saw ethics philosophy more generally as a relation to oneself. For Davidson, an improvisatory attitude also implies a specific type of relationship to oneself, a relation that involves a conception of one's obligations and freedoms. Improvisation becomes a manner in which one conducts oneself that is also inevitably a relation to others and to the world. Now, this conception draws upon Foucault's understanding of ancient philosophy as vitally concerned with the care of the self as Davidson calls it, an attitude or form of attention one has towards oneself, but also a complex and regulated domain of activities or work on oneself. The improvisation becomes one of the crucial technologies of the self, but the aim of improvisation here is to create a form for oneself that is recognizable without being rigid, a coherent form that is nonetheless flexible, responsive, unpredictable, yet trustworthy. We have to detach ourselves from the already given systems, orders, doctrines, and codes of philosophy to open out to a new ethos of spiritual change. The ultimate goal is mobility of form, a form of subjectivity that can be a source of disquiet and instability, but also of creative joy and self-possession. Um, so between 2010 and 2012, uh, we started to formalize a presentation style based on the Berlin event, a kind, of, a kind of artistic research that incorporated a combination of a public performance with a subsequent interactive conversation. Um, Davidson's insight on the nature and implications of computer-human interactivity introduced new philosophically-based insights that Rather than invoking all too facile representations of cyborgs or post-human tropes, insisted on aspects of human experience that resonated crucially with his concerns around practices of the self, moral perfectionism, exemplarity, and understanding of philosophy as spiritual exercise. Um, the first of these presentations was part of Monica Sh Sh Shevchik's series of video dialogues a shot at the Logan Center of the University of Chicago in 2012. And this is from episode six, began with Davidson's account of what he was thinking about in 2007. And um, I went into that, I'm going to admit, publicly <laughs> and on camera, a little skeptical. I thought, OK, the three musicians, I, I, I know how good they are. But what, what is this computer-driven piano going to be able to do? You know, it's a, it's a machine. Um, and I came with all the presuppositions that philosophers can come to, having thought about theories and not heard practices. And within, I would say, four or five minutes of the conference, um, part of the concert, that is, of the conference, after all of the discussions we had, I stopped thinking about the machine and I just started listening. Yeah. And I, was, I, I came away from that thinking, well, I have to rethink all of my philosophical ideas. What responsibility is, what freedom is, what creativity is. Because I heard a, a quartet with four participants who were interacting with one another. And I think that experience and our encounter there in Berlin, when these things came together, thinking about philosophical practices and the way that led to thinking about freedom in a new way, mm -hmm thinking about improvisation in music and the way in which one could transpose those ideas into non-musical contexts so that music wasn't just something one went to on the side but actually became part of the idea of a way of life. Yeah. And then listening to that concert and thinking, well, what is responsibility? Right. It seems to be responding and you seem to be responding to it. So Davidson's thinking uh, would eventually, as he remarked later in this dialogue, he started to see improvisation everywhere. 
you know, the idea of it transposing ideas about music into non-musical context, that's sort of music to my ears, so to speak. Um, and I think improvisation sort of led me to thinking in this way. Um, uh, this understanding came from Davidson's, in part, came from his first invocation of improvisation as a way of life. That was the name we gave to our dialogues. And that was a gloss in the English language title of Pierre Ardo's philosophy as a way of life, spiritual exercises from Socrates to Foucault. Um, this framing of Davidson's of improvisation as a way of life, as allowing us to disrupt our fixed framework and introduce creativity where previously we were restrained by habit, recalls Gilbert Ryle's 1976 article entitled simply Improvisation. I want now to go further and to show that to be thinking what he is here and now up against, he must both be trying to adjust himself to just this present one solely situation and in doing this to be applying lessons already learned. There must be in his response a union of some ad hocery with some know-how. If the normal human is not at once simplifying and improvising warily, he is not engaging his somewhat trained wits in some momentarily live issue, but perhaps acting from sheer unthinking habit. So thinking, I now declare quite generally, is, at the least, the engaging of partly trained wits in a partly fresh situation. It is the pitting of an acquired competence or skill against an unprogrammed opportunity, obstacle or hazard. It is a bit like putting some new wine into old bottles. Well, it's very interesting. I, I think it was Lydia Gurr who pointed out, because both of us cited this article in our 2007 talk at Berlin, that Ryle never mentions improvisation. And her explanation of that was that Ryle thought that aesthetics were basically bullshit anyway, so there was really no reason to talk about that. And but the thing is, you've got to remember that at this time, and for many years after, I mean, philosophers, had they really wanted to, you know, talk about improvisation, there, I mean, there's a whole world of music to talk about, but they never seem to get around to it. You know, there is Vladimir Yankelevich, there is a Philip Alperson. I mean, it's real different now. You got, hey, you got Eric Lewis, you got Gary Hagberg, you got Lydia Gurr, you got other people. But back then, it was kind of a thin gruel, and you have, I have no idea why they never got around to talking about it. But I found that Ryle, he must have known about it, so I found it strategic rather than unmindful. I mean, for one thing, both Ryle and Davidson provide an ironic counter to the traditional view of improvisation from mid 20th century classical music and also dance in which the practice's fatal aesthetic flaw is its supposed nature is habit-based, iterative, and repetition oriented. So what he's saying is if the ones who aren't improvising are the ones who are acting from habit, not the improvisers. That's a huge move. And um, you might not notice it. Um, moreover, as Pierre Adeau reminds us at one point in his book, we're not dealing with a mere work creation of a work of art. The goal is to transform ourselves. So for me and a lot of my subsequent work, uh, improvisation-based but also technologically-based, foregrounding the aesthetic as the only mode of encounter with improvisation, it's, it's a sort of a part to whole inversion. You're risking turning the larger concept of improvisation into a false metonym for musical improvisation. So for my work now, I'm trying to avoid, well, I've actually gone through the looking glass. I'm, I'm, a narrow focus on the aesthetic ultimately becomes a distraction from the fundamental task of illuminating improvisation as a way of ethical life. Not only a way of knowing, but a way of caring, a way of attending, listening, introspecting, conducting, orienting both outward and inward, fashioning of the self a permanently permeable membrane that allows bi-directional transfer of information. Now, so in Davidson's conception of improvisation as a way of life, it's freedom and not the aesthetic, which is at stake. He reminds us that the space of liberty is up to us, and that it's freedom itself that emerges from an improvisative life in which, quoting here, self-transformation intertwined with social formation will occupy the center of our ethical and political work. Nothing is guaranteed, but stability and comfort are not the or only orientation to life. Each of us must decide whether this ethos is worth the trouble and the risk. So in 2011, Davidson and I performed, presented a performance and a discussion with Jerry Allen of, the, of, a, of, a, of myself as trombonist. You're going to see a short uh, performance from that. This is 
a Voyager like thing. A Voyager draws upon early 80s AI ideas, uh, a 1950s cybernetic social musical networks of free improvisation, creating a social aesthetic that includes creative machines as central actors. Creative machines have been designed to stake out musical territory, assess and respond to conditions, assert identities and positions, all aspects of improvisative interaction, both within and beyond the domain of the arts. So my own efforts to imbue interactive systems with values such as relative autonomy, integral subjectivity, computer individualism, musical uniqueness rather than repeatability, both draw on and challenge traditional notions of human interactivity and sociality. So here's a brief example. So at one point in the post-concert discussion with Jerry Allen, Davidson referred to the act of listening as a kind of moral ability. And the remark brings up ideas that eventually crystallized in Davidson's 2016 article on moral perfectionism and improvisation, which takes as ex exemplar the music of Sonny Rollins. In his article, Davidson draws upon Ado's ideas on spiritual exercises in this way, attention, is the fundamental stoic spiritual attitude. This is Ado. It is a continuous vigilance and presence of mind, self-consciousness which never sleeps, and a constant, constant tension of the spirit. We could also define this attitude as concentration on the present moment. Attention allows us to respond immediately to events as if there were questions asked us all of a sudden. Well, improvisation for me is a prime site for this kind of questioning. And as Davidson noted in the discussion, you have to listen to what's happening in order to be able to respond. And it's not only that you need the cognitive skills, but you need the moral will to keep paying attention. Um, in the panel discussion, Jerry Allen offered another interpretation of the question of attention. In performing with the computer, Priana, she related, I felt vulnerable, you know, in the moment, from idea to idea. I was really paying attention because I felt vulnerable. The experience of listening is itself an improvised act engaged in by everyone, and that becomes an expression of agency and choice conducted in a condition of indeterminacy. Now, this alone should make us sensitive to our vulnerability in improvisation, even as we practice active engagement with the world. If the, sub if the subaltern can't speak, he or she is obliged to listen, and acts of listening and responding inevitably place us in a condition of momentary subalterity, whatever our designated social, racial, gender, or class position. Is that to say, is that, to say that you didn't feel like the, the um, machine was going to step in and hold you up if, the per, if, you, know, if you were coming to a, a low point on your side? Well, I, I, I just think it, um, you know, I did feel that it was responding, and I couldn't, I, I didn't know how it was going to respond, but I knew it was going to. So it was, it was harder to predict than with a, a human associate, of course. I, I don't know if I would say that. Well, Dave, I wouldn't know if I would say that either, and Davidson seems to agree. He says, the ethical and political tasks and values of improvised computer music are not different in kind from those in improvisation between human performers. If machines are to participate in the ethos of improvisation, the poles of self-transformation and social intelligibility have to be central to our encounters with them. Now, interacting with creative machines presents opportunities to address those larger questions of social intelligibility, as well as creating its politically infected 
politically inflected, critical imbu critically imbued aesthetic space in which, as Alfred Schutz has noted, a study of the social relationships connected with the musical process may lead to some insights valid for many other forms of social intercourse. Now, because creative machines can manifest self-organizing interactive musical behavior that operates both independently and in dialogue with the viewer auditors constructing games and activities, performances with them are not simulations of actual musical experience, but to reference this musing, uh, a form of making music together. Now, in that light, the anthropologist of technology, Lucy Suchman's assertion that human interaction succeeds due not simply to the abilities of any one participant, to construct meaningfulness, but also to the possibility of mutually constituting intelligibility in and through the interaction. And that leads us to view the interactive encounter with creative machines as one might view any improvisation as a form of negotiation. So part of listening, of course, is listening to oneself. In the thought of Davidson, pleasure and freedom become deeply entangled with the concept of intelligibility as reflected in his mentor, Stanley Cavell's conception of moral perfectionism as containing the demand of listening to oneself in order to make oneself intelligible, both to oneself and others. Perfectionism concentrates on this moment, Davidson declares, since improvisation is the free creation of difference. It challenges and calls for intelligibility, even where differences in intelligibility are a source of discomfort. Cavell, for his part, he uses the, mu the late music of Beethoven to make a larger point about how conventions that ground intelligibility can suddenly fall away. He says, convention as a whole is now looked upon not as a firm inheritance from the past, but as a continuing improvisation in the face of problems we no longer understand. Going further, as Davidson wrote in a program note for the, 2011, 20, for the 2012 Michigan concert, when one is pushed to go beyond already established models of intelligibility um, and habitual practices of the self, when one searches for new forms of self and social intelligibility, new modes of freedom, the improvisatory way of life assumes all of its, not only all of its ethical political force, but also its very real risks of unintelligibility and self collapse. Now, for, um, so in a 2012 talk at Wellesley, Wellesley College where Stanley Cavell came to the gig, that was cool, um, <laughs> um, collective intelligibility unfolds in real time when the participants in social interaction are committed to making sense of and giving sense to themselves and others. Or as Barbara Herman put it, without some level of social agreement, the risk of unintelligibility and unintended harm can be great. One of the dimensions of moral creativity will then be social, something we have to do together. Now at some point during a mid-concert discussion, Alexander von Schlippenbach considers the frequently posed questions to whether how you make mistakes in this music. And you can read this example, even if the sound is a little poor. There was an interesting question, can you make mistakes in this music? And uh, our friend at the Parker had a good answer. Mistake is missing the chance. Yeah, yeah basically the chance to do something. I mean, sometimes you can decide to do nothing. But there is, of course, there are points that require something. And then you miss this, then it's gone. Columbia University philosopher Lydia Gerb makes a distinction between improvisation extempore, a modality related to musical performance, and improvisation impromptu, a more general human condition that, quote, situates persons in unforeseen consequences and confronts them with unexpected. Um, obstacles. For Gur, an improvisation impromptu can engender moments of joy that reveal a divine inventiveness. Schlippenbach's observation that we just heard makes common cause with Gur's notion of improvisation impromptu is, quote, what we do at singular moments in the moment when we're put on the spot, particularly when we're confronted with an unexpected difficulty or obstacle. Now, Stephen Greenblatt, for his part, would call that opportunistic. Um, but in any event, these observations are also highly congruent with Cavell's conceptual migration from the life of musical composition to living in the world. He says, the success of an action is threatened by other familiar ways, by the lack of preparation or foresight, by the failure of the most convenient resources, natural or social, for implementing the action, a weapon, a bridge, a shelter, an extra pair of hands, and by a lack of knowledge about the best course to take. 
or a way to proceed. To survive the former, threats will inquire ingenuity and resourcefulness, the capacity for improvisation. To overcome the last will demand the willingness and capacity to take and seize chances. So here we can glean the sense in which moral perfectionism, like modernity, is necessarily an incomplete project, that is to say, achievement without attainment. Davidson's work on improvisation points to how the philosophy of music, again, might importantly occupy the center of the intellectual pi picture, just elbow those other jerks out, uh, by demonstrating how philosophy can draw upon the music to eliminate larger human ways of knowing and doing beyond the purview of the arts in ways that the field is only belatedly engaged. Now, I said I was going to stop, and I'm almost there, but let me just unburden myself to a little more. Um, my models for interesting improvisation technologies are the Mars rover and the problem of the self-driving vehicle. I love the Mars rover. It's, it's like... Um, it's like uh, Booker T. Washington, cast down your buckets where you are. Start from right here where you are. You know, they, they drop the thing from space, it plops itself down, opens itself up, and goes to work. And, it, you know, it has to do some things on its own because it takes, what, seven minutes for a signal? You can't, you can't drive anything like that. It's got to have some personal stuff going. So it's a lot like, I feel it's a lot like what I do. Uh, and I wish I could have tried to do something. I mean, driving is basically kind of improvising, and I've always felt that much could be learned from the efforts to get computers to improvise by musicians. I mean, they should, these people working on these things should hire Gerard and Mark and George right away, and they should bring them into Tesla or whoever, and they'll get the thing to work faster if they do. Now, computer scientist Philip Agre has ag argued that an activity of worlds of realistic complexity is inherently a matter of improvisation. By inher inherently, I mean that this is a necessary result, a property of the universe, and not simply of a particular species of organism or a particular kind of device. In particular, it's a computational result, one inherent in the physical realization of complex things. Now, this gets me to this idea I borrowed from uh, David Harvey of a fundamental condition of improvisation. Now, in truth, I can tell you, I set a very low bar for improvisation, and this is how low the bar is. In my own conception of the condition of improvisation, first, we're all agents operating in a fundamental and continuous condition of indeterminacy, uh, where we can't fully know what will happen next. We make judgments, we analyze our environment for clues to where we are headed and to seed our judgments about where we're headed. And that activity is itself improvised since we can't, you know, we can't see everything at once. Um, and finally, we make a choice. Now before, after we make that choice, we can imagine it as proceeding from the analysis of the environment, but we can't be certain of either causality or correlation. I mean, you can say, I'm going to do this because, but can't prove it. Same way you can say, I did this because, same thing. No proof there, no proof is possible. So I'd like to suggest that these four characteristics are sufficiently primordial that in a given proceeding, the absence of any one of them means that the activity in question is not improvised. I'd like also to claim that the above elements, indeterminacy, agency, analysis, judgment, and choice, will be found in any improvised act whatsoever, artistic or not, humans, machines, animals, etc. Finally, I'd like to suggest the condition of improvisation is permanent everyday quotidian and as ubiquitous as contemporary critical method allows us to assert. Sort of like, you know, if you're a Trekkie, it's like this is the warp signature of improvisation. Um, this framework for recognizing of not defining improvisation proceeds from the understanding that as, even as we continue to explore the nature and practice of musical improvisation, maintaining the coherence of ideas beyond the frame of music calls for a certain vigilance in guarding the freedom of the concept of improvisation from possible colonization by the arts people and the music people. Um, in maintaining that vigilance, we allow the invocation of the personal and the social on a broader basis while allowing a cross-pollination between music and the wider world in which we can understand indeterminacy not as oppositional to improvisation as in a post-cage conception, but as an aspect of everyday life that is addressed improvisatively. So the question of independent intelligent machine agency is actually a pretty long standing. To offer one example, and far from the earliest, in 1869, John Stuart Mill wondered, hmm, supposing it were possible to get houses built, corn grown, battles fought, you know, causes tried, and even churches erected and prayers said by machinery, by automatons in human form. Certainly musical machines were part of even earlier imaginings, notably Ada Lovelace, the Countess's 1843 prediction of the computation of elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity. 
When our machines improvise musically, they allow us to explore how, music, how meaning is exchanged through sound. To improvise is to encounter alternative points of view and to learn from the other. Improvising with computers allows us a way to look inside this and other fundamental processes of, of interaction. In this regard, creative machines that take part in collective musical improvisation exemplify this radical position of Lucy Suchman. I take the boundaries between persons and machines to be discursively and materially enacted rather than naturally affected, in other words, no essence is here, and to be available for refiguring. At the moment when musical improvisation with machines enacts this radical fluidity of identity, what we have again is not a simu simulation of musical experience, but music making itself a form of artificial life that produces non-artificial liveness. Now, so here's an example. You know, I'll never forget that people were obsessed by how does it work? How does it work? And you gave an answer which I often, you've probably forgotten it, but I haven't. The first question, and I've seen this happen again and again when we've done this, someone sees the computer playing the piano and it sounds, put it this way, too good to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and someone always asks right at the beginning, how does it do it? How does it do it? As if that's going to solve all their problems. And you looked out into the audience when that person asked that question. You said, I don't know how I do it. Well, working on improvisation with machines over the last 40 years has taught me a, l a little bit about how I do it, although there's obviously still much to be learned. In fact, this quest for knowledge of the improvising self is one of the major impetus behind the work in this area for, for me and others. And one of the most successful human computer interactions in music has been the OMAX project, headed by Gerard Assayag, Georges Bloch, Marc Chemillier, Arsha Khan, Shlomo Dubnov, Jerome Nika, Bernard Lubat, um, Erev Salah, and others. Um, in OMAX, an improvisation-oriented musician machine interaction system, uh, I'm sort of paraphrasing from an important 2013 paper, learns in real time from the human performers, and you all know this, I'm just rehearsing this for a moment, generating an improvisation from the learned model. Uh, and this team describes in this article their understanding of the process of human improvisation and improvising performers informed by continuously from several sources, her partners, herself, the instantaneous judgment that can alter plans on the fly to open up new directions in the music, sound images of her present performance and of other performers are memorized, thus drifting back into the present to the, to, to, into the present from the past. Figures from long-term memory, actually it's a sort of bi-directionality of present and past, I think, in the OMAX work. Figures from long-term memory also act as sources of material that can eventually be recombined to form new improvised patterns. Now, as I wrote in 2000, quote, as notions about the function and nature of music become embedded into the structure of software-based musical systems, interactions with these systems tend to reveal characteristics of the community of thought and culture that produced them. Now, on this level, machine learning systems such as OMAX and non-machine learning algorithmic systems such as Voyager exhibit commonality in the sense that they both represent both aesthetic and procedural models, however contrasting of how meaning is created in improvisation. Another commonality comes from the fact that both Voyager and OMAX perform differently with different improvisers. With OMAX, difference emerges in the transformation of the performer's music through what they're calling stylistic reinjection, the process of, quote, reinjecting musical figures from the past, providing an always similar but always innovative reconstruction of the past. This is one of the major issues trying to balance of recurrence and innovation. This is a very important point. Re balance of recurrence and innovation that makes interesting improvisation. In Voyager, a listening process provides parameters that the system can adopt in the production of its own music. In this sense, both systems adapt their performers. One major difference in the two systems, I'm not sure about this, and I, I welcome uh, correction on this point, is that Voyager can also create music in the absence of a partner. In that sense, the system has an independent manner of performance. It is not the product of past performances, but of its embedded system of rules and tendencies. Now, in both systems, I hear these as behavior models, however assembled. In Voyager speak, 
there is a kind of a Voyager speak. When I do this thing with David, David with Damon Holsborn, we have, it sounds like twin speak. We're talking about variables and this and that, and no one can understand us. Um, parameter sets are called behavior sets. One alters the behavior of the system by specifying values for each of the variables for each channel, or rather the system actually does that on its own. And when the behavior is specified, the sonic result can be taken as a model. And in that way, that I imagine that machine learning algorithms listen to a corpus of musical behaviors, say, as with recent research by Nick Collins, you know, like Xenakis' choral instrumental electronic music or Adele's uh, work. A machine learning algorithm could then listen to one of the Voyager created models as a spur to creating more music in that vein, or it could just listen to music, Voyager making music on its own for a few days or weeks. Or you could have an OMAX Voyager duo performance. That would be pretty cool, and I think that's certainly possible. Now, as John Stuart Mill tells us, Human nature is not a machine to be built after a model set to do exactly the work it prescribed for it, but a tree that requires to grow and develop itself on all sides um, according to the tendency of the inward forces that make it a living thing. Now, in that light, I find myself thinking, wondering if a hybrid OMAX Voyager model could be created. Um, I don't know, since I don't really know enough about machine learning to tell if you could actually do that, and I'm hoping that some young people or whoever's working on this will buttonhole me during the con conference and tell me, the aging warrior, so I can learn some new tricks about the progress being made on this front. But perhaps a well-tuned integration of machine learning and its models and corpuses with algorithmic music generation can produce an intimate connection between learning and growing. And along these lines, I've lately become interested in the intra and interspecies improvisation along the lines suggested by the clarinetist and philosopher David Rothenberg. Now, as you can see here, recent research by neuroscientist Julia Hyland Bruno, who is attending the conference, uh, is drawing on work on improvisation and technology of machine learning to provide new perspectives on how birds and perhaps humans uh, learn how to sing. Now, there's this thing of zebra finch song bouts. We're going to hear one of those in a moment. They exhibit within individual diversity in both sequence and timing, as well as variability between individuals. How such performance le level plasticity is acquired and whether it serves any social function is not really known. And Bru Bruno is proposing a biomimetic biomimetic approach for probing zebra finch vocal interactivity by means of three different types of software-based virtual birds that can respond to real-time acoustic input from a live zebra finch. Now, virtual bird models two and three, as you can see here, I think they, they really particularly close closely track the capabilities of Voyager and OMAX. Now, here's a short example of the zebra finch song bouts. You're going to hear it. That's it. Oh. Now that was incredible. That was one of the real bouts, right? Yeah. Oh. These keys and the microphone and the speakers are all connected to those computers. Like that's what this mess of wires is. Um, Who's making that sound? That was the speaker. But he pressed the key to hear the song. Now, is this a male and female here? Or? That's one male, and this is a um, plastic bird. Oh, plastic bird. Oh, I see. That's why is it plastic bird? It's like a father figure for the bird um, while he's learning. So now he's an adult, but he's been developing his song in his cage. Um, by pressing on the keys. Well, every time he presses on the key, he hears it. So you got key leaves right next to you now? Mm -hmm. or, they or both of them. They both, they do the same thing. And they press and what happens? They hear the song. So if they don't want to hear the song, they don't have to. Um, and sometimes they press and then they sing themselves, like they sing with. Now, as I finally really do conclude, um, I want to point out that the stakes have been raised in recent years because machine improvisations are now often indistinguishable from those created by humans. For many, this is a truly unsettling prospect, not least because musical creation can no longer be portrayed as the exclusive and ineffable province of designated super people with powers and abilities far beyond those of mere mortals. 
a certain line has been crossed, a certain transgression is in the air, and one fear expressed by many as well articulated by Lucy Suchman in terms of the fear of, quote, a project to displace the biological individual with a computational one, and that's a successor to the now ubiquitous transformation of the nature of work that began with the Industrial Revolution and gained new urgency starting in the 50s. You will be replaced by a machine. Now, one defensive response is to simply exist, insist that there will always be a place for people and that place will be on top of the hierarchy. Now, I've already often told you that that seed is not automatically there. We will have to earn it ourselves. And I also, I haven't spent the last 40 years creating non-hierarchical, sonically humanoid robots and creative environments to simply reimpose those hierarchies. Now, in my Too Many Notes article from 2000, I wrote that dealing with creative machines deals with the nature of music and in particular the processes by which improvising musicians produce it. These questions can encompass not only technological or music theoretical interests, but philosophical, political, cultural, and social ones as well. Now, as I see it, working on improvisation and machine creativity has shown us the way to the democratization of creativity as a fundamental human property that need not have anything to do with art making, but has everything to do with how we get along in the world. And perhaps our improvising computers can teach us how to live in a world marked by agency, indeterminacy, analysis of condition, and the apparent ineffability of choice to celebrate our vulnerability as part of a continuous transformation of other and self. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>